Yolanta, and, and thanks to the organizer for, for having the opportunity to, to share a couple of observations with you on a very broad topic. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to say is not comprehensive at all. I think it's rather a couple of kickoff um, remarks, which you might take into the breakout um, sessions. Talking about the EU's foreign and security policy, uh, I think we have to bear in mind something which is very often assumed as commonplace, but I think it's a very important context we should not forget about. Um, also in these difficult um, uh, weeks and months of, of war, but the 21st century is one of a great power rivalry and of great power competition. That means that uh, many of the certitudes uh, according to which the European Union wanted to help structure the world uh, are not valid any longer. So a type of um, hard interaction, the use of hard power, coercive means has now been much more than two or three decades ago, an element of international affairs. Um, I think what is important for us to note is that um, the end of the West, as it was predicted by many uh, not long ago, has not, has not succeeded. And I think the war has not taken place. And I think the, the war, in a way, has brought a renaissance, at least of the uh, transatlantic relations, even though we cannot take that for, uh, for granted. Um, so the way from the pictures from Afghanistan um, were uh, the, the, the West sent signals of, of, of retrenchment, of retreat, of withdrawal, are in clear juxtaposition and contradiction to uh, the, the support of, of Ukraine in terms of military aid humanitarian and financial aid. Um, I think the role of the European Union uh, is not quite clear, uh, but it is quite clear that the EU wants to play a role and that the European Union is amidst a process of, uh, uh, of, of learning. It learns, it is in a process of so socialization of power, as it has been called. Uh, where it, of course, sees that um, as uh, the high rep for foreign relations, Mr. Bora called it, where it uh, begins, has to begin to learn uh, the language of power. And I would add the EU, which um, traditionally has been very much focused on policies of modernization of partners in the world, of partners in its vicinity. Uh, uh, the EU as an entity which very much is based on sort of technocratic policy making now has to accept the relevance of uh, geopolitics and geoeconomics. And I think on the rhetorical level, this has already started. In, on the practical level, the EU has been thrown into this new modus operandi uh, by, by the war and also by some developments before. I think there is um, a certain um, chance now, an opportunity through the tragic events and the war, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. My personal assessment in the last 10 or 12 years was that uh, crises, which very often have acted as a catalyst of more Europeanness, of bringing the EU closer together, they have often. Um, developed in the opposite way. Very often uh, crises like the migration crisis, for example, uh, they um, offered opportunities to external actors to insert a wedge between European countries. And I think with the war in Ukraine, that might, that might change because we see uh, it's maybe not an external federator, the war uh, and Russia's malign behavior, but it's a sort of uh, an assistant of change and transformation. If you look, for example, at energy policies, you know, the diversification efforts we have on the level of member states, like, like in Germany, but also on the EU level, 
uh, that's quite a quite um, uh, dynamic process and one which is hardly um, reversible. I think for the EU, it's about assertiveness and actorness. Would it be able to reach assertiveness and actorness? And I think in the next years and decades, it's about four core challenges in this context. And of course, we are observing a sort of securitization of EU policies. By the way, I think here we have a fundamental difference among member states. We have a couple of member states, certainly Poland or the Baltic states, for whom security always was a core element of their, not only their identity, but also of their European and foreign policies. Whereas for other countries, at least hard security, but also other elements of security were at the kind of, um, uh, were not so much in, in, this, in, the, in the center, uh, because they looked through the, uh, through the world through the eyes of, um, of soft power or of civilian power. Now, what are the four challenges? And I just will be very brief. Um, uh, in the context of, of security and reaching more assertiveness and activeness, uh, first, I think, um, yes, security um, means that we have to prepare for war. Um, and I think uh, here the EU is has still not found um, a common challenge of how to improve its own efforts on the hard side of the spectrum. So what should the EU, EU really do in order to uh, get more capability to act when it comes to foreign and to security and defense? Um, uh, should this be something like a preparation for the moment when, for example, the US turns to Asia? Or should it be something which is only an assistance towards fostering and strengthening transatlantic relations. So I think here we have still different strengths among uh, member states. And I think it will be important to create a new consensus, a new Euro-Atlantic consensus uh, within the European Union. Second, um, the European Union, of course, now uh, has to accept in total, many member states did it, that security and actorness means that it has to have a neighborhood which is at least stable, but which in many respects has to get closer to the EU and, has, and in some cases has to become a part of the EU. That's why the enlargement policies, we all know the question of the uh, candidate status for Ukraine. Now, by some, by much more, by many more, is thought through the glasses of, of geopolitics. Enlargement policy now is also foreign policy and geopolitics, and not only integration politics um, anymore. So that's the, the, the big question, how to ensure the new commitment for its direct uh, uh, and indirect neighborhoods. Third challenge, um, security uh, um, and assertiveness will take place, will also take place in a crucial way in the domain of technology. Uh, many of us have heard the buzzwords of um, supply chain autonomy or strategic autonomy of the European Union in the, in the field of industry. Um, the Americans have done an important signal. I think in 50 years, when the history books will be written, this year, 2022, will be one of two core events, Russia's war against Ukraine, of course, but also uh, the rising um, adversary of the US and China, the American, the United States have passed a, a new law, a so so-called Science and Chips Act, to regain its kind of uh, sovereignty in terms of semiconductors, you know, because the Americans uh, know that uh, for China's uh, uh, objective to assert itself on the world stage, uh, this field will be will be key, and the European Union also has its own Chips Act. So I think this is a clear signal that um, the Europeans uh, are aware of this question of uh, technological dependency in the world. And of course, the, the fourth challenge is how can the European Union uh, pursue its interests in the world 
which definitely will not be predominantly shaped according to uh, multilateralism, uh, which will not be a world of, uh, of uh, which will not be a rules-based world. And I think uh, the, the EU's foreign policy was very much based on the assumption that our intra-European way of doing it, so clear rules, principles, all are obliged to, to do that. That of course, not all the world uh, follows that paradigm, but that uh, the EU will be able together with its allies to foster uh, this, this model, to, to, to kind of propagate a universal model of multilateralism. Now, this is increasingly questioned and the EU has to find way how to organize the part of the, the parts of the world which still are in favor of, of principles, of rules, of international law, but also to engage other parts of the world in a pragmatic way, at least in some elements of multilateral arrangements. So how to involve, for example, autocratic regimes uh, in, in the climate, uh, in the international climate policy uh, and, and similar cases. In a, in a time so as Robert Kagan wrote in his famous book, when the jungle grows back, uh, the European Union has limits with its traditional um, apparatus of, um, of uh, with its traditional instruments and its ways it wants to organize the world. Finally, and I, I finish on that, this requires, of course, a permanent common analysis of, of threats. So the EU is good at producing strategic documents, uh, global strategy and, and, and other questions, uh, strategic compass and documents like that. It's, it's very important to fill these broad documents with, um, uh, with content now. And I think here, and that is kind of something we should try to work about in spite of all differences we, we notably have between Germany and Poland. I think uh, member states, bilateral cooperation of member states and regional groupings in the European Union should be rather building blocks uh, of this kind of uh, common, permanent shared and common analysis uh, of threats uh, in the world and of ways how to, to co-shape it. So, and I think here we should, in German-Polish relations, apart from the issues we're, we're all the time discussing, and where we have also very often a dissensus on Russia, on, on NATO, um, here we should also, also open up uh, the debate for these new affairs, for these new domains, like technology, like supply chains, or also how to tackle the challenge uh, emanating from China.